Order. There being 37 ayes, 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Macdonald. Pursuant to Standing Order 190, uh, I seek leave to make a personal explanation in, in relation to a matter in which I was grossly uh, misquoted and uh, misinterpreted by the Leader of the Greens in the last debate. Is, that's, that's normally done at 3.30, um, Senator Macdonald. Uh, I, I'm sure that in accordance with the practice in this place that will be accepted at 3.30. It being uh, after 2 p.m., I pr proceed to questions without notice. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer to the Senate's constitutional role as a House of Review and to use the Minister's own words as a chamber of accountability and scrutiny. I also refer to numerous statements by Senator Milne and other Green senators about the importance of the Senate in diligently reviewing legislation and by the Prime Minister herself when she promised a new era of accountability and to, quote, let the sun shine in. Will the minister confirm that the government and the Greens propose to guillotine an unprecedented 55 bills through the Senate this week? Will he also confirm that this will bring the total number of bills that the government and the Greens have guillotined through the Senate in the last three years to 216, compared with 32 in three years the coalition held a majority in the Senate? How does the minister defend this scandalous abuse of process? The uh, minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you. I, I start by, by not having a short memory. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I sat on that side of the chamber during the Telstra debate and the privatisation of the Telstra debate, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the promises that Senator Joyce made to the Queensland public when he promised he would vote against it and voted for it in the end. But notwithstanding all of that, what we saw was even during the committee stage, your minister was so inept and feeble that during the committee stage you actually orchestrated your own Dorothy Dix speakers to take up time during the guillotine of the committee stage of the privatisation of Telstra. Absolutely disgraceful. You were so afraid of scrutiny, so afraid that your minister was unable to answer the questions in this chamber that you organised th third trash. You organised you you organised you organised people using a guillotine in that bill. Then we have work Choices, work choices. The most vicious, the most vicious anti-family working bill that you have ever seen put before the Australian public. Ran through. I'm uh, reminded by good Senator Collins. Rammed through both houses in one day. You are shameless to stand here. You are shameless to stand here. You are shameless to stand here and pretend you have every anything other than contempt order. for this chamber. Time's expired. So, to, order, 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 order. No, no. Wait a minute, Senator Betts. You're entitled to be heard. On, on my right, Senator Betts is. And on my left, Senator Abetz is entitled to be heard on silence. Senator Abetz. Can the minister assure the Senate that Labor has done no deals with their Greens alliance partners to get their support for this unprecedented use of the guillotine? If the government has done deals or made arrangements or come to understandings, what are those deals, arrangements or understandings? The, uh Minister. Thank you. Uh, a majority, as was just demonstrated in this chamber, agreed to bring forward and ensure with a time management motion that we passed the legislation. And so, so they are, there are some in this chamber who are interested in passing the budget. 
There are some who are interested in passing the education reforms that this country so desperately needs. We know that those on that side, Mr. President, have no interest in. I have sat and listened during the morning to filibustering from Senator Fifield, filibustering from other members. Order, order, uh, uh, order, Senator Brandis. Mr. President, on the, the point of order is on direct relevance. The minister was asked, as the first supplementary, a specific question: Was the Greens' support for the guillotine motion secured by a deal, and if so, what were the terms of the deal? The political rhetoric in which Senator Conroy is now engaged has no bearing whatsoever on the question he was asked. Senator Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On the point of order, Senator Conroy is being directly relevant to the question. The opposition here talks about deals. Well, the deal is to progress legislation. Order. There's no point of order. The minister has 20 seconds remaining. The minister. Uh, opposite have no genuine interest in progressing this legislation, but a majority in this chamber do, Mr. President. A majority in this chamber want to see Australian children get the best possible education with the best possible support with the best possible support in the classrooms there is a majority Order, in this time's expired Senator Betts. i note no denial of a deal with the greens given that labor and the greens have controlled the numbers in the senate for the last 3 years and also controlled the preparation and scheduling of legislation does the leader of the government in the senate accept any responsibility at all for allowing the situation to arise where 55 important bills are to be guillotined through the Senate in just 57 and a half hours of sitting, almost twice as many in one week as the Coalition had in three years. The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I take and the government takes no responsibility for the endless filibustering, both in this chamber and the other place where those opposite in both chambers Mr. President, have set out to frustrate the government's legislation on many, many occasions. So there have been situations where the backlog of bills has been caused by the other chamber due to the fact, due to the fact that those opposite have opposed just about everything but the uh, budget itself. Just about everything but the budget itself they have opposed all the way, Mr. President. They're not interested. They are not interested in better schooling for our children. They are not interested in a national broadband network. They are not interested, Mr. President, in a disability care scheme. They are not interested, Mr. President. They are not order, interested, Mr. Order. President. Time's, order. Time's expired. Order. 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 Order on my right. Order. The order. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, and that's Minister Ludwig. Is the Minister aware of the wonderful news just through that UNESCO's World Heritage Committee has listed an extension to Tasmania's Wilderness World Heritage Area of some 170,000 hectares? following 30 years of campaigning from conservationists in Tasmania and around the world to protect order 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 Senator Milne, continue um, around the world to protect the state's tall forests if so can the minister tell me what undertaking uh, did the government make to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee regarding further assessment of the area for its cultural values. So, send, uh, before order, Senator Conroy. Uh, Wait a minute, President. Uh, uh, Senator Ludwig uh, looks after agricultural. Uh, I uh, represent on behalf of Minister Burke uh, Environment. So I'm happy to take the question, uh, the, Senator Milne. The, the minister then representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, Senator Conroy. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Senator for her question. Today, the 37th World Heritage Committee, at its meeting in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, accepted the Australian Government proposal to add more than 170,000 hectares 
to the World Heritage List protecting forest areas in the Upper Florentine air and areas within the Styx, Hewan, Picton and Council River Valley. This decision means some of Tasmania's most spectacular and precious areas of native forest have been given the highest level of environmental protection. There are many sites, there are many sites of deep cultural significance, Mr. President, within the World Heritage Boundary. The Australian Government is continuing its consultation with Indigenous communities in Tasmania to ensure these cultural values are considered at a future meeting of the World Heritage Committee. Mr. President, work has begun on a study of the outstanding universal cultural values of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, including those areas within the new boundary. This extension to the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area means areas of exceptional beauty, particularly its majestic stands of tall eucalypt forests, glacial landforms and alpine and subalpine environments are now afforded the highest level of protection. The boundary extension will significantly enhance the wet eucalypt forests within the property and will enhance the connection between its tall eucalypt forest and the rainforest. Additional important habitat for rare and threatened species such as the endangered wedge-tailed eagle and the Tasmanian devil are also included in the boundary extension. The Great Order. Western Tears. Senator Conroy, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. And I further ask the minister, uh, given this very good news for Tasmania, what actions will the minister take to ensure that the Tasmania Wilderness World Heritage Area is not opened to logging by any future state or federal government? Order, order, the order, the minister, the minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr President, the new boundary also adds to the representation of the glacial features and processes in the World Heritage Area, including landforms which contain evidence of glacial movements along the walls of Jerusalem and Central Plateau millions of years ago. On 31 January 2013, Australia requested an extension of the boundary of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, and this request, as we now know, has been accepted. As to the specific issue that you raised, I'm happy to take that on notice and see if there's any further information that the minister can provide. Order. Order. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, I would appreciate knowing what we're going to do to stop logging in by any future state or federal government. And in fact, I ask what actions will the government be taking to ensure the integrity of the boundaries of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area is not threatened by future federal governments? Order. Order. The Minister. Well, the simple solution is to ensure the re-election of a Labor government rather than those environmental vandals on that side if you want to give genuine protection to this area. Uh, and, Mr President, those opposite have again started off by saying no, started off by opposing, and as you can hear from all of the interjections from those opposite, Mr President, they have no commitment, no commitment whatsoever to this decision and to the maintenance and support of this decision. So the Australian public, Mr President, should be under no illusion that the, the environmental and economic vandals on that side of the chamber have not changed. They will continue to put the uh, environment in Tasmania at risk, and every Australian should bear that in mind in the election in September. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. I ask, can the Minister outline to the Senate what steps the government is taking to enhance the superannuation system and what this will mean for the retirement savings of working Australians? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Thank you to Senator Marshall for the question. Like other Labor senators, 
He is a strong supporter of Australia's superannuation system. And of course, remember that the superannuation system, the superannuation guarantee for working people, was built by the Labor Party and the Labor movement, and it is only the Labor Party and the Labor movement which will ensure it will be built upon and grown. What we will see, Mr. President, next week is the start of the gradual increase in the SGC rate from 9 to 12 per cent. And this will mean uh, it, the first step in a significant increase over a number of years to the superannuation savings of working people. From 1 July, 8.4 million Australians will have their contributions paid into their superannuation accounts increased to 9.25 per cent, and the rate will continue to increase each year until it reaches 12 per cent on 1 July 2019. This will mean a substantial increase to the retirement savings of working people. Now, Mr President, there are few things more steeped in Labor values uh, than the superannuation system. Labor built it, Labor built it over the opposition of those opposite and those who preceded them, and it is only Labor that will deliver uh, the strengthening of the superannuation system for working Australians. But let's remember what the position of the opposition is. The opposition leader is on record as describing his position on superannuation as follows. We have always, as a coalition, been against compulsory superannuation increases. We have always, as a coalition, been against compulsory superannuation increases. Well, Mr President, very clear articulation of the values of Mr Abbott and the coalition opposed to increases in superannuation, opposed to increases in the retirement savings of working Australians. Order. Time's expired. Senator Marshall. I thank the minister for that answer. And I ask, can the minister provide the Senate with information on the gains for workers across different industries from the increase to the superannuation guarantee? Minister. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and thank you to the senator for the supplementary question. Well, as I said before, millions of Australians will, will benefit from the government's superannuation reforms. Uh, and we have new analysis that was released recently by the Treasurer and Mr Shorten, which shows the significance of the gains from the increase to the superannuation guarantee across various sectors. And I'll go through some of them as requested. For example, the increase in superannuation savings for a 30-year-old employee who retires at age 67 and earns average full-time wages for their occupation will be around $75,000 for childcare employees, over around $124,000 for construction and mining labourers and for electricians, around $82,000 for hospitality workers, $66,000 for hairdressers, $79,000 for receptionists. And of course, the pool of national savings would increase by more than half a billion by 2037 under the government's policies. Senator Marshall. And I thank the minister for that answer. I ask, can the minister outline to the Senate the benefits of the superannuation tax cut provided by the government's low income superannuation contribution? And again, could the minister break this down by sector? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the government's low income superannuation contribution will remove the tax paid on uh, contributions for low income Australians. It will provide 3.6 million workers from the 1st of July. Uh, from the 1st of July last year, including 2.1 million, million women with a tax cut on their superannuation. And I'll just give you some analysis, Mr. President, uh, of the effect of a tax cut on someone's compulsory contributions for 12-13. Around $338 for checkout operators, around $457 uh, for childcare employees working four days a week. Uh, around $450 for midwifery and nursing professionals working two days a week, around $360 for receptionists working three days per week, and I could go on. All of these people would face a tax increase uh, were the coalition to win government. Every low-income Australian would get a tax increase on their super. It shows what a risk to working Australians the opposition would be. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Uh, why is the Gillard government not prepared to have a proper debate in the Senate uh, about the superannuation legislation, amendment service providers and other governance measures bill 2013? Uh, in particular, 
Why is the Gillard government so scared to have a proper debate on the merits of our constructive proposal to ensure that at least one third of the directors on union dominated industry super fund boards are independent? A proposal uh, which was, of course, su uh, supported at first in the House of Representatives, uh, which is completely in line with Labour's own Cooper Review recommendations and in line with our coalition policy uh, to improve corporate governance uh, for people's superannuation savings uh, so that their retirement savings are both maximised and saved. Why is the government so scared to have a proper debate about this bill? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And it's always good to see that, at the end of the day, those opposite have form on the issue of superannuation. For those who have long memories, and possibly only, possibly only Senator Faulkner or uh, Senator Boswell might have been here when it was all first debated. I could be being unkind to both of them when I say that. Those opposite opposed superannuation, lock, stock and barrel. At every, every possible turn, they have sought to strip back the benefits for ordinary Australians in the superannuation account. In the lead up to the 1996 election, Mr. President, those opposite promised to keep the increase in superannuation that had been promised by the Keating government. And quickly, quickly after the election, they abandoned that promise. It became one of those fabled non core promises, Mr. President, a non core promise. And we all know, Mr. President, that the opposition leader is again intent when it comes order. to superannuation. Senator, Senator Conroy, order. Just, res order. Just resume your seat. Senator Corn. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. President. It's uh, a point of order in relation uh, to the requirement for the minister to be directly relevant. He's been going for more than a minute. He hasn't got anywhere near the question, uh, which was about a specific bill and why the government is not prepared to have a proper debate in relation to a specific bill that is before the Senate, and more specifically uh, in relation to the corporate governance arrangements for superannuation uh, funds. There was a very specific the minister, question there. I believe the minister is addressing the question. The minister still has 56 seconds. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. Minister. The government is not afraid, Mr. President. It's not afraid to debate this bill. I'm not sure I can debate the merits of the bill in question time right now, as it's before the chamber. But but, Mr. President, I am more than happy to stand here and expose those opposite for their hypocrisy when it comes to superannuation. Because, Mr. President, the Treasurer and the Minister for Superannuation recently released new analysis which shows how much workers in particular occupations stand to lose under Tony Abbott. And I would Order. happily you debate this all the way through. You need to refer to people in the other place by oh, their group title. My apologies, Mr. Rabbit. No, no, my apologies, Mr. Rabbit. I will happily debate this now and every day between uh, now and the election, Mr. President. Every Australian worker with superannuation knows those opposite have form. They're not just about delaying the increase; they're going to scrap Order. it Order. completely. Order. Time's expired. Order. 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 Wait a minute, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann. Uh, given the minister didn't go anywhere near. Uh, answering the question, I have a supplementary question. Uh, given the bill lingered in the House of Representatives for nearly six months before the House spent 54 minutes to deal just with uh, our one set of constructive amendments to improve uh, corporate governance for super, with the House supporting our amendment at first before Labor forced the back down at the behest of the unions, uh, why does the government think it is appropriate to give the Senate less than an hour to deal with this and another three super bills it has attached to it as well? The uh, Minister. Well, Mr. President, we're ensuring that this bill won't linger in this chamber because, Mr. President, a 30 year old childcare worker stands to lose around $75,000. A hairdresser will lose around $66,000. A hospitality worker would lose around $82,000. An electrician will lose around $124,000. Under those opposites policy, Mr. President, under those opposites policy on superannuation, Mr. Mr. Rabbit and the Liberal Party can't be trusted because this is what Mr. Rabbit has said about superannuation in the past. He said Cons compulsory superannuation is one of the biggest con jobs ever foisted by governments on the Australian people, and he said that 
and the 25th of September in the Parliament in 1995. And those opposite, those opposite, Mr. President, still order. Time's, hold that time's position. Ex time's expired. Send a order, order, order. Well, when there's silence, I'll ask Senator, I'll ask Senator Cormann to ask his question. When there's silence on both sides. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister again didn't go anywhere near the question, I'll ask a further supplementary. Uh, given Labor's complex my super measures are due to come into effect in just a week from now, why has the Gillard government let things uh, drift in the House of Representatives for months, only to now ram things through without the proper scrutiny that it deserves uh, here in the Senate? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President, and I, uh, I reiterate what I said before. We have no intention of letting this bill drift. We intend to pass this bill by the end of the week. And, Mr. President, it just goes to show what a glass jaw those opposite have on this issue. A glass jaw. Because just last year, Mr. Abbott said the coalition has always been against compulsory superannuation. My apologies. It's actually the 23rd of March 2012 in a press conference. And Mr. Rabbit said, we have always, as a coalition, been against compulsory superannuation increases. And you could hear in the tenor of the question that completely fabricated claim, the union-dominated super funds. Yes. I remember Mr. I remember Mr. Rob. I remember Mr. Rob wrote a column in the bulletin many, many years ago where he, he bailed the cat about Order. those opposites. Time has expired. Senator Ludlam. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My questions to the Senator uh, or the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator McLucas. Is the Minister aware that homelessness increased in Australia by 17 per cent between the 2006 and 2011 census, leaving a total of 105,000 Australians, with almost two thirds of people making requests to specialist homelessness services for accommodation, being turned away back onto the street? Will the government commit today to providing the resources to ensure that no one seeking homelessness services in this way is turned away from services and support by 2020? The Minister representing the Minister for Housing and Homelessness, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senator for the question. Mr President, I think our government has a very strong record when it comes to, to housing policy in, uh, uh, since we've been in government. We've had, a, we've had a, cir a, a circumstance where, first of all, uh, we had a housing minister, unlike those opposite. <laughs> we've, had a we've got a order. circumstance. Senator Ludlam. Um, President, a point of order which goes to relevance. With respect to the minister, I haven't asked about the legacy or the record. I've asked about future policy taking us to 2020, and I ask you to draw the minister to the actual question I asked. Order. The minister has only, only been going uh, just under 22 seconds. I think the minister is answering the question. I will listen closely to the minister's uh, answer. There is no point of order at this stage. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Our government remains committed to the 2020 targets of our white paper on homelessness, of halving the overall rate of homelessness and providing supported accommodation to all rough seekers who seek it. The ABS census data released last November shows the rate of people sleeping rough fell by 13.5 per cent between 2006 and 2011. The rate of Indigenous homelessness has fallen by 14.5 per cent. The census headline figure showing an increase in the rate of homelessness of 8 per cent, however, is disappointing. The increase reflects the challenge and the complexity of homelessness. However, more people are getting the help that they need. Specialist homelessness services provide important supports in the form of accommodation and other assistance to vulnerable people in times of crisis. And we are committed to uh, the continuation of current service levels that uh, and would like to reaffirm to the services sector, all stakeholders and clients, that the Commonwealth's level of investment, as well as our commitment to quality and transparency, will continue. That's why we've committed up to $159 million over the next year toward a transitional agreement to be matched by the states and territories to co continue to, to tackle homelessness. However, currently only four states 
Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales and Tasmania have committed funding uh, to that uh, project. Senator Ludlam. Thanks, President. I thank the minister for her answer in my first supplementary. Uh, as you have acknowledged, on any given night in Australia, almost 7,000 people are sleeping rough. Has the government costed what it would take to build a permanent dwelling for every rough sleeper in Australia? The minister. Uh, I, I don't have data about whether we've costed that, but can I go to the, the point of your question? The point of your question is that we're going to build uh, accommodation for every person who's sleeping rough doesn't actually understand the complexity of homelessness. The complexity of homelessness means that there are people in different circumstances at any point in time who have different uh, pathways to the fact that that person has slept rough. And just to say that we're going to build accommodation like that does not answer the question. We need an array, we need an array of services that, that go from uh, short-term services to long-term permanent housing, which we have done a lot of in the last uh, it, since we've been in government. Senator Ludlam. Um, thank you, uh, President. And I ask a final supplementary. The prefabricated uh, structured insulated panel and modular housing industry offers great promise to significantly reduce housing costs and construction times and establish a sustainable and affordable Australian housing industry. Has the government investigated the reduction in time and cost that this industry could offer to get people off the street and into permanent and high quality housing? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As a representative minister, you would, be, uh, you would understand that I don't have the level of detail that you are asking. If there is further information, though, I'm happy to take that uh, to, to get that for you. But it doesn't, it doesn't answer the question. The answer, I, uh, sorry, it doesn't. Your question doesn't uh, acknowledge the answer I gave earlier, in that these are locational questions. They, they vary around the country from time to time. There is not a simple answer to homelessness, and we have to be responsive in many, many ways, in different ways, and maybe uh, relocatable homes is part of the answer, and I'll take, for, I'll take that uh, uh, on notice. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator McLucas. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress of Disability Care Australia? Thank you. The Minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr President, and I do thank the Senator for her question. Mr President, in just one week, Disability Care Australia launches around our country. In one week, a new future will begin in Tasmania for young people aged between 15 and 24, in South Australia for, young, for children aged between 0 and 14, and in the Barwon area of Victoria and in the Hunter area of New South Wales for people up to the age of 65. From 1 July 2014, Disability Care Australia will commence across the ACT and in the Barclay region of the Northern Territory. Rollout of the full scheme in these states and territories, as well as Queensland, will commence progressively from July 2016. Mr President, that will mean that 90 per cent of Australians will be covered under the agreements we've made with the states and territories. But we also want to see Western Australia step up to the plate and make sure that no one is left behind. Mr President, last week the government appointed a long-standing champion of disability reform in Australia, Mr Bruce Bonnyhady, AM, as the inaugural chair of the Board of Disability Care Australia. The board will set the strategic direction of Disability Care Australia and play an important role in safeguarding its financial sustainability, including by commissioning and then considering, considering actuarial advice in its decision-making. The board members appointed by the government have extensive experience in the disability sector, in insurance matters, in financial management and in corporate governance. These appointments have been endorsed by all states and territories. Next Monday, the 1st of July, marks the culmination of years of effort from government from the disability services sector, from advocacy groups and, most importantly, people with disability and their families and carers. Disability care is yet, to be, is, is yet one more legacy of Australia's unique... Of, oh, sorry. Disability Order. Care Australia... Order. Time's expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister inform the Senate 
on how the National Disability Insurance Scheme will provide a boost to the economy. The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The government is committed to boosting the economy and ensuring that all Australians have the opportunity to participate in employment. In Geelong alone, the establishment of Disability Care Australia headquarters will create about 300 jobs. This is in addition to the 120 jobs already announced for the agency's Geelong regional office, which will open on 1 July. The government is continuing to build workforce capacity through the $122.6 million sector development fund. The fund, will help, the fund will help national disability services provide business support and training to local organisations to ensure Australian businesses thrive. And at a national level, we have secured a strong and sustainable funding stream for disability care, with an increase to the Medicare levy. And yesterday, Minister Macklin announced more than $500,000 in funding to the National Disability and Carers Alliance to run a series. Order. Times expired. Send the lines. Thank you, Mr. President. Further to my first question, my last supplementary is: Can the minister advise the Senate? on what the launch of disability care on 1 July will mean for people with disability, their families and carers. Minister. Mr President, the Gillard Labor government has been working hard to deliver Disability Care Australia since we received the Productivity Commission's report in August 2011. Following extensive consultation, we have developed a scheme that asks what a person needs to reach their full potential not one which determines eligibility based on the type of disability the person has or how or where they acquired it. When disability care starts on 1 July, services and supports will be planned around the person's individual needs. This will include, for example, funding for home modifications like hoists and handrails, or for a, more, or for a formal carer to support families in their caring role. Local area coordinators are already on the ground and from 1 July will help people with disability and their families and carers get the support they need from the community and to work with other services like their schools or employment services to get Order. the very Time's best expired. outcomes. Senator Mason. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer the minister to the fact that the Prime Minister has described the Gonski reforms as the biggest change to school education in 40 years. I also refer the Minister to the fact that only two hours and 45 minutes has been allocated to debate the Australian Education Bill 2013 and the Australian Education Bill Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2013 in aggregate. Doesn't the government's refusal to allow proper parliamentary debate and what he, what he alleges to be the greatest change to school education in 40 years, indicative of the shallowness of the government's rhetoric? and its desire to avoid genuine scrutiny of its own legislation. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr President. Those again opposite Mr President are demonstrating their contempt for the intelligence of the Australian public. They stand up here and say they're opposed to it. They're not going to introduce it. And then they demand the right to filibuster their way through to the parliament rising so that the government can't pass it. Mr President, those opposite have no interest in the education of the children of our nation. They have no interest in improving our schools and lifting the results for all students. They have no interest. They have no interest because Mr. President, only a Labor government believes in a stronger, smarter and fairer Australia. Mr. President, the 2013-14 budget delivers almost $10 billion, confirming the Prime Minister's offer to implement a new national plan for better schools, regardless of sector, regardless of state. Regardless of state. Mr. President, those opposite did everything they could behind the scenes. Just sit down, uh, Senator Conroy, because interference is finished, so you can continue. Mr. President, those opposite did everything they could 
despite Premier O'Farrell's agreeing to ensure that the students of New South Wales got the best possible education. They put enormous pressure on Premier O'Farrell not to sign. Once again, they are more interested in short-term politics than they are the welfare and the needs of school students in New South Wales. So, Mr President, when they stand up in this chamber and cry crocodile tears that they don't have a whole week, a whole month to oppose and filibuster their way through a debate, order. oppose and Time filibuster has expired, away. Senator Conroy's order. When there's silence on my left, Senator Mason. Thanks, Mr. President. In the case of the Australian Education Bill 2013, the government has set aside 165 minutes to debate the expenditure of $16.2 billion. Does the, money, does the minister seriously believe that giving the Senate one minute of debate for every $100 million the government plans to spend anything but a complete insult to Australian taxpayers? Order the Minister. Thank you for the Order. Mr. President, Order. Mr. President Minister. what's an insult to Australian taxpayers is the fact that the best those opposite can come up with is to getting out a calculator, plugging in a few numbers, working out how many lines. That's the best the alternate government have to offer when it comes to the most significant reforms for our children's education in our country's history. How many full stops were there? Have you counted the full stops yet? Because that will be your only contribution if we gave you one hour or one year to debate the bill, Senator Mason. One hour or one year, you'd be adding up the number of full stops. That's it. Because you are opposed to this bill. You are opposed to Australian children getting the best possible education. And those opposite, Mr. President, will continue to cry poor all the way through question time. When they are not interested in the merit or the substance of these bills, they Order. simply. Time's expired. Senator Mason. Thanks, Mr. President. Given that the government cannot say where the extra $16.2 billion is coming from, cannot explain how spending that $16.2 billion will drastically improve literacy and numeracy and cannot reassure thousands of schools that they won't be worse off under its so-called reforms, is it true that the only thing left in the government's education revolution is the guillotine? The minister. Mr President, I fundamentally reject the premise of his question. But let me give you, let me give you a very simple statistic. It took two full days, two full days just to process and go through the amendments to the EPBC. Two full days. Those opposite, Mr President, have been engaged in a filibuster. They have been engaged in a filibuster on every bill, every piece of legislation that they can, just so they can come in and complain that we have to pass a time management motion just because we've got the past one, to absolutely make sure that Australian children get the best possible education. Because those, because those opposite, Mr President, have got nothing positive to contribute. Nothing positive about reforming the economy, nothing positive about reforming Order. In education. Order. Time has expired. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Carr. Can the minister update the Senate on the situation in Rakhine State, Myanmar? The Foreign Affairs Minister, Senator Carr. President, last year, senators will recall communal violence broke out in Rakhine State between Buddhists and Muslim Rohingyas. The, uh, the conflict resulted in 192 deaths, the destruction of 8,000 homes, and the displacement of 140,000 pe people, mostly Rohingya. But the discrimination against this population goes back a long way. It goes back over 100 years, predates the present government in uh, Myanmar by uh, a long way. They are a stateless minority. Most do not have citizenship rights, and that is the core of the discrimination they face. Australia's response to this is, first of all, to urge the government of Myanmar to produce uh, not easy, given the hundred years of discrimination 
a just resolution to the plight of these people, and second, to lend a hand in getting aid in in providing assistance. I'm proud to say that Australia is providing food for 100,000 displaced people through the World Food Programme, that's in Rakhine State. Protection for 37,000 children, contemplate that, 37,000 children who've been separated from families, and tents and emergency shelter for 32,000 people who fled or lost their homes, and that money's been allocated through the UNHCR. Uh, the condition in the camps has been described by people who've spent time there and who know what they're talking about as the worst refugee camps on the face of the planet. Our aid's providing blankets, clothes and mosquito nets for 14,000 people living in temporary shelters. The rainy season is making living conditions harder and increasing health risks. Our latest commitment is $1.5 million, therefore, to help UNICEF to provide 40,000 people with safe drinking water, water and better time sanitation. Has expired. Senator Bishop. Thank you. Supplementary question to the Minister. How is Australia supporting development in Myanmar in the long term? Minister. Mr President, as well as humanitarian assistance, Australian aid to Myanmar is targeting long-term development assistance to eliminate poverty. Recent political reforms have improved the operating environment for donors, making it possible to increase our aid in Myanmar. And we've invested $140 million in the country over the past three years. Next year alone, we'll provide around $82 million in aid to Myanmar. Uh, we're providing aid for 1.9 million people with malaria, 22,000 with HIV and 135,000 people with TB. We've helped more than 900,000 children go to school, uh, including, among other things, by providing textbooks and stationery. Our aid has helped repair 1,000 primary schools. It will provide 120 new Australia Award scholarships this year for studying in Australia. Remember, this is a country where half the population won't complete primary school. The bishop. His final question to the minister, Mr. President: Can the minister update the Senate on the state of education in Myanmar? Minister, well, Mr. President, this goes to the core of the development challenge the country faces after being retarded by dictatorship for all the all the decades since the, uh, the military coup of 1962. This is uh, children in Myanmar face the prospect that they will have a lower level of education than their parents. Successive generations have been affected by low government investment in education, a shortage of teachers. Aung San Suu Kyi spoke to me about how education is inferior to the education she received in the 1950s. In 2010, around one million children were not attending school, and only 54 per cent of children completed primary school, as I said a moment ago. The Myanmar government is completing a comprehensive education review. We're co-chairing with UNICEF, the working group which is overseeing the review. The review will help to better target investment in education. We've allocated $80 million over four years Order. to help with Time this has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer to the fact that under the government's guillotine motion, the Senate has been given approximately 15 minutes to debate the Migration Amendment Temporary Sponsored Visas Bill 2013 on Thursday. Given that this is a contentious issue of policy that needs to be properly debated, why is the government using the guillotine as a political tool to avoid scrutiny, negating the principles of accountability and openness? Minister, order the Minister representing the Prime Minister. Order, Senator, Senator Conroy. Mr President, as I answered a few moments ago, the opposition are crying crocodile tears when it comes to com complaining about the length of time available to debate this bill. If they hadn't filibustered, if they hadn't wasted two full days on the EPBC amendments, if they hadn't spent all their time deliberately gumming up the works of this chamber, we wouldn't be in this position, Mr. President. But those opposite, those opposite who are the rank hypocrites for what they did with work choices, for what they did with the Telstra bill, Order. now Order. want to pretend Order. to Order. you. Order. Yes. 
Uh, wait a minute, Senator Brandis. On relevance, Mr. President, the question was about the Migration Amendment temporary um, sponsored visas bill. It was about nothing else. It, was, it asked why the government was guillotining that particular bill. References to Telstra, references to the EPBC, reference, uh, references to other legislation earlier in this parliament or in earlier parliaments cannot be relevant to that question. Order. 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 Senator Collins. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The question was about one aspect of the government's time management program. And uh, Senator Conroy is explaining the form and the behaviour of this opposition and why it has been necessary to take such measures. Order. I believe the minister is answering the question. There's no point of order. I'm listening to the minister's answer. The minister has Thank one you, seventeen President. remaining. Those opposite again with these time-wasting points of order to grandstand and just repeat endlessly their same mantra goes to the heart, Mr. President, goes to the heart of why it's necessary. Those opposite, Mr. President, have no interest in debating these issues. They have an interest in pursuing Mr. Abbott's no policy agenda. They want to oppose, oppose, oppose. They simply want to be using this chamber as part of their political strategy. Well, you will be exposed. You will be exposed on that side of the chamber for having no interest in substantive policy debate, having no interest whatsoever in substantive policy debate, because those opposite, Mr. Because those opposite, Mr. President, those opposite, Mr. President would not be able to make a positive contribution to these debates. They simply would stand up and say no, and then they would waste the rest of their time trying to justify their opposition for opposition's sake and trying to support Mr Order. Abbott. Order. Time's expired. Order. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. A supplementary question. Given the government's deliberate failure to conduct a regulatory impact statement in relation to the labour market testing aspects of this bill, isn't it true that the extraordinary haste with which this bill is being rammed through the parliament is confirmation of the total control that the union movement has over the Green Labor government? Order. 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 Now, when there's silence, I'll when there is silence on both sides, I'll proceed. When there's, when there's silence, I'll proceed. Order. Order. When there's silence, we'll proceed. So, you haven't got the call, Senator Conroy. Senator Conroy. Senator Conroy. Uh, Mr. The President, call. thank you. And could I thank uh, the Senator for that expansive question about the motivations of uh, some legislation before the chamber. Because now I am, as I've said many times and will continue to say uh, in this chamber, Mr. President, a proud member of the Transport Workers Union, as proud as, proud as Senator Brandis is for being probably in the toughest union in the white collar industry, the lawyers' union. And Mr. President, those opposite, those opposite, Mr. President, have no, they have. A, I have no interest in this legislation other than to reveal other than to reveal what every Australian should know. They hate trade unions, they hate working families, and they intend to pursue an agenda that will undermine the living standards, undermine the conditions of all Australian workers. And you hate trade unions. Order. You Time hate has expired, Senator Conroy. Time's expired. Se order. When there's, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Cash. President, a further supplementary. Isn't it true that guillotining of debate on this important piece of legislation demonstrates that Minister O'Connor and the Labor government have an arrogant contempt for the Australian people and the Australian parliament a trait which has become the hallmark of this government. Order. The, the minister. I'm not sure if that actually qualifies as a question or, or a rant, Mr. President. But those opposite, those Order. opposite, Order. those opposite have put together a political rant and pretend it's a question. Well, I reject absolutely every aspect, not the premise, every aspect of that question. Order. 
Sindigalica. Order, Sindigalica. Order, 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 order. Sindigalica. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister Assisting for Tourism, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Gillard government is supporting the tourism sector in regional Australia? Order. The Minister Assisting for Tourism, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank uh, Senator Gallagher for his uh, question and his uh, well-known interest in the Australian and, in particular, the South Australian tourism industry. Uh, Mr. President, the, the Gillard government supports tourism across Australia, including in our regions, uh, through a range of targeted grants programs and initiatives, and through our highly effective marketing tool, uh, the uh, Tourism Australia. In the uh, 2012 uh, round of our T12 grants program, nearly 90 per cent uh, Mr. President, of successful applications were from outside Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane with a very high proportion being in regional areas. Uh, 294 applications have been received for the current TCOR round, which closed on 3 May. Mr President, uh, successful applicants uh, will be announced later this year, and we expect many regional projects to again uh, earn a grant. Direct uh, support for a regional tourism sector is provided through our uh, $48.5 million Tourism Industry Regional Development Fund Grants program known as TURF. Successful applicants under the first round of TURF were announced in March. In that round, we initially offered a total of $13.5 million Senator Ronaldson, to 65 successful applicants, um, leveraging a total of $141 million investment in regional tourism across Australia. An additional 19 high-quality projects will share in a total of $4.3 million funding under the Round 1 projects. Uh, round two of TURF opens today. I was very pleased to be able to announce the second round on Saturday at the Sepultsville Estate Winery in South Australia's iconic Barossa Valley. Sepultsville has been offered $250,000 under round one of our TURF program. The winery owners uh, believe uh, the projects uh, have planned uh, with the support of TURF will boost order, their visitor numbers order, by 30 per cent. Debate across the chamber should cease. Order. 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 Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the specific benefits of round two of the Tourism Industry Regional Development Fund grants program? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, thank uh, Senator Gallagher for his uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, the uh, round two of the TURF program opens today and closes on the 7th of August. The second round is making nearly uh, $10 million available for projects that will boost regional tourism. Many of the uh, successful projects uh, will be bricks and mortar initiatives that will improve the quality of existing tourism destinations, products and services. Others will be new and innovative tourism developments. Uh, we've also included specific labour and skills funding stream in this round called Labour and Skills Enhance. This stream uh, makes more than $2 million available for projects that improve regional Australia's capacity to increase tourism labour supply and lift service quality. This funding will uh, support labour and skills related infrastructure such as training centres or staff accommodation. It's also available for a broad range of uh, projects that deliver targeted practical measures to address labour and skills needs such as the training order, programs and order, regional tourism. Order. Time's expired. Order. 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 Now, order on both. Order. 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 On both sides. I insist that we have quiet so that the person asking the question can be heard in silence. Order. Order. Um, in front of me, to my right. Order. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My uh, second supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate why it is important to support the tourism sector in regional Australia? O order. Look, on both sides. Order. 
sen ora sen ora ora senator ora minister minister thank you, you mr president uh, thank uh, senator gallagher for his excellent uh, supplementary question uh, 45 cents in every dollar spent on tourism in australia is spent in uh, regional destinations there were nearly 2 million international visitors to regional Australia in the year 2012, and collectively they spent about $3 billion. Domestically, there were 47 million visitors to regional Australia, and they spent more than $23 billion. Clearly, tourism is an integral part of the local economy for many regional areas. The latest statistics suggest that tourism's contribution to regional economies is growing. International tourists are increasingly looking for uniquely Australian experiences, many of which are in our regions. Australian holidaymakers are visiting our regions more often and spending more time and more money in those areas, which is supporting local jobs and regional economies, even in far north Queensland, Senator. Uh, this government's support for regional tourism is helping order, the industry to... Order. Time has expired. Senator Conroy. Uh, the questions, uh, further questions be placed on the notice? Senator Conroy. Uh, Mr Deputy President, for the information of the Senate, I table additional advice on a question asked to me last Thursday by Senator Birmingham, and I seek leave to incorporate the information into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. On 20th of June, Senator Payne asked me a question in relation to the Remote Jobs and Communities Program. Uh, I have some further information in relation to that question. I seek leave to incorporate it into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McLucas. Deputy President, I seek leave to provide the Senate with some extra information to the question that was answered, asked of me today uh, by Senator Ludlam. And you have uh, you seek leave to have it incorporated in Hansard? No, I'll just uh, I'd like I'll provide, to yes, give that Sen information. Is leave, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I can advise the Senate that all states and territories have now co uh, committed to the Transitional National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness for 2013-14. Thank you, Senator McLucas. Are there any motions? Senator Wish Wilson. Mr Deputy President, pursuant to Standing Order 745, I ask the Minister for Finance and Deregulation for an explanation as to why answers have not been provided to question on notice number 2992 us on 23rd of May this year. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Um, certainly, Senator Wish Wilson is uh, very prompt, given that I think the 30 days expired yesterday. Uh, and uh, the question does seek a large amount of detail from across government. Uh, the, in case the Senate is not aware, the government has been asked for a list of clothing all clothing companies used by all government departments over the past three years. Uh, and uh, which companies supplied the material, fabric, thread, buttons and zips, for government uniforms uh, these, uh, and, and the like. Uh, it's obviously a very substantial amount of information. We'll certainly endeavour as quickly as possible to get Senator Wish Wilson a response to the question. I would make um, a couple of points in relation to the substantive uh, content of, of the question, or the, the substantive core. Uh, the first is that the Commonwealth procurement rules, uh, for which um, the finance portfolio is responsible, do require those making procurement, uh, to uh, to making procurement decisions to ensure that they are using Commonwealth resources in an efficient, effective, economical and ethical manner that is not inconsistent with the policies of the Commonwealth. Uh, in addition, there is a specific obligation at paragraph 6.7 of the Commonwealth procurement rules that agencies must not seek to benefit from supplier practices that may be dishonest, unethical or unsafe. Uh, and under our devolved financial management framework, compliance with these rules is a matter for individual agency head, heads. The, government, uh, the Department of Finance and Deregulation provides guidance and support for Commonwealth agencies in complying with those rules. So that goes to some of the issues uh, that were raised in relation to the question. Uh, I will also ensure uh, that we, uh, as, as quickly as is practical, provide a formal response to the senator. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Uh, am I allowed to? Yes, you, you have the right to continue, yeah. Senator Wish Wilson. Um, I thank the minister for her answers. Um, government 
has a very important role to play in showing leadership on this issue. It's not just about buttons and, buttons and zips. Uh, this is actually a much bigger and very important uh, issue uh, of how we ethically source uh, garments. Um, Four Corners will be showing a uh, documentary tonight that relates to the collapse of uh, Rana Plaza in Bangladesh on the 24th of April, which nearly uh, 1,200 people uh, have been killed by. Um, the Senate did show some leadership on this issue, um, just recently passing a motion calling on all the major retailers to sign the Bangladesh Accord. Uh, following that motion, uh, I wrote to uh, Woolworths, Coles and Kmart asked them if they would be signing that accord. Uh, so far I've received an explanation back from Woolworths that they do intend to sign that accord and they, they, they certainly understand the significance um, of this issue. Um, this is all about education and awareness to the Australian public. Um, I must confess going shopping with my 13-year-old daughter recently, um, there's very little information around on where documents are, sorry, where um, garments and clothing items are sourced from. Um, we often don't realise that attached to the production of these clothes are some appalling working conditions um, and that will be covered by the Four Corners documentary tonight. Um, but I do want to say that government has an important role uh, to show leadership on this issue and, and raise, raise education and awareness. It certainly wasn't a flippant question, nor was it at all a witch hunt, um, Senator. I, I did see an opportunity with the documentary being uh, this evening to get this on record. Um, if we can show that we do have a, uh, some sort of certification process for, uh, for the garments procured by the Commonwealth, that could set a good example and a good role model for other businesses. Now, while Coles and excuse me, Woolies and Kmart are looking uh, at signing the Bangladesh Accord, that is only with one country and it is only three organisations. Uh, a large number of retailers and importers also bring in cheap products from foreign countries. Uh, that are also associated with appalling uh, worker safety conditions uh, and pay conditions, etc. So this is a really big issue. It relates to fair trade, this whole debate we have around fair trade versus free trade. Um, it's all about price uh, these days in our consumer society. Uh, we buy a lot. Uh, we expect to pay virtually nothing for particularly items of clothing. Uh, but what we don't do is stop and think about uh, where those clothes are made and under what conditions they're made and whether our buying patterns are actually supporting and locking in appalling working conditions. So how do you, uh, how do you beat this? Well, you need an uh, education and awareness program and you also need a certification process, some sort of process that, uh, if not through a voluntary code, then a mandatory code, uh, compels producers to uh, identify uh, where those garments were made and where they were sourced and what ethical conditions could go with that. And I just thought it was a good opportunity for the government to, uh, to show some leadership on this issue, and that's why I sent the questions through, Senator. So I'll uh, look forward to receiving those responses. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of uh, answers given by Senator Conroy uh, to questions asked by uh, myself and Senators Mason and Cash. Uh, Mr Deputy President, the Gillard government is in complete chaos. They are unravelling before our eyes. Chaos, dysfunction, division, incompetence everywhere. They're either with a you know, hand at each other's throat, the other hand with a knife in each other's back, they're all a jumping ship, packing up their bags, packing up their offices. I mean, they're all over the place. I mean, the Gillard government hasn't just lost its way, it has lost the plot. But guess what? There is one thing. In the middle of all this chaos, in the middle of all this dysfunction, in the middle of all this division and incompetence, there is one thing that will always unite the Australian Labor Party, and that, when it come, that is when it comes to do the bidding of the union movement. When there is a vested interest of the union movement at stake, they will not leave any stone unturned. And of course, so it is this week. I asked the question of uh, Senator Conroy, as to why there was not going to be a proper debate in relation to the uh, superannuation uh, legislation, amendment services, providers and other governance 
Measures Bill 2013? And the answer is very simple, because the union movement is desperate, absolutely desperate, to see this bill go through uh, without the sensible amendment that was proposed by the coalition in the House of Representatives, and that extraordinarily was passed by the House of Representatives uh, 72 to 68, which would say at least one-third of directors on union-dominated industry super funds be independent directors to ensure that there are some proper tensions on superannuation boards, to make sure that there is an appropriate diversity of skills, background and perspectives on superannuation boards. But of course, the union movement is desperate to prevent that from happening, even though the government's own Cooper review, which was commissioned by former Senator uh, Nick Sherry, who actually cared about good policy in superannuation, the review which he commissioned recommended that it was absolutely vital to ensure that there was appropriate provision for indep independent directors on industry uh, super fund boards. But of course, uh, Minister Shorten, at the behest of the union movement, who uh, didn't want any, any interference in its cosy uh, corporate governance arrangements that are currently in place, uh, went out of its way uh, to stop uh, that particular measure from going ahead. So here we are. We are being asked in the Senate tonight uh, to deal with not one, not two, not three, but four superannuation bills in less than an hour. Now, in the House of Representatives, which is not usually uh, known to be uh, a very detailed House of Review, which is not known to take a lot of time uh, in relation to the uh, final details and the final policy issues uh, behind uh, specific uh, pieces of legislation, they spent 54 minutes dealing just with one set of coalition amendments to improve this legislation. Yet here in the Senate, where we are supposed to be the House of Review, where we are supposed to provide proper scrutiny of executive government proposals. We're, not, we're, we're going to be lucky if we're going to have half an hour for the four bills, given all of the divisions that are probably going to uh, fall over from, from before. But, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President, this is really uh, just an indication of everything that is wrong with the Gillard uh, Labor government. For six months, for six months, this bill lingered in the House of Representatives with the government doing nothing to progress it. Nothing. And then, of course, all of a sudden they put it up and they lose a vote on the floor of the House of Representatives, which, if there wasn't so much other incompetence and chaos going on, would probably have been front page news. But, but in the middle of all of the chaos and incompetence under the leadership of uh, our current Prime Minister, it is very hard even for a lost vote in the House of Representatives to get itself onto the front page of the newspaper. And so here we are, uh, the government ramming this through. Things have become so ridiculous. Minister Shorten is now lobbying the Financial Planning Association for, for them to lobby me so that I would lobby the government to add something else to the uh, list of um, legislative bills to be guillotined. I mean, he, why doesn't he talk to his own people? Why does he ask the Financial Planning Association to lobby me so that I lobby the government on his behalf? I mean, this government has just completely lost the plot. Uh, clearly, uh, they're all going in 102 different directions. Uh, I mean, it is time for this farce to come to Order. an end. Order. Your time has expired, Senator McCorm uh, Cormann. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I think the, uh, the Labor government makes no apology for having a full legislative agenda. And I suppose, to be fair and give credit to the opposition, they shouldn't be shy about taking credit for actually delaying the legislative agenda of the Labor government. And on the other side, I suppose there's always a star on the other side, and that's probably Senator Macdonald. In the short time that I've been in this 43rd parliament, I have noticed that Senator Macdonald has never missed an opportunity to filibuster, amend, procrastinate, report and waste the time in my considered view, of the Senate. And that's his job. He's in opposition. Doesn't like being in opposition, but that's his job. So he's there very diligently working away at every opportunity of wasting a second a minute. He's probably got a blackboard in his room and he goes up and works out how much he's wasted every day. And that's, uh, as I say, their job. What we have is a limited sitting period and a full legislative agenda. 
If we uh, just take a cursory glance at the number of bills that have been passed through the 43rd Parliament, we would see they're a very large number. And I think I read the other day that 87 per cent of them are actually 87 per cent of them are actually consensus positions. But as we get down to the end of the legislative cycle, the, le the end of opportunity to pass legislation, we notice an increase in the activity of the opposition to use up all of the available time, and that's their job. Make no mistake, they're stars at it. Use up all of the available time, and then when the government faced with an agenda of not completing its, uh, its rightful task, implements with the Greens the guillotine, well, all hell breaks loose. I'd like to talk a little bit about the superannuation industry. I'm not sure that uh, uh, Senator Cormann really is on the mark there. Despite the fact, despite the fact that you oppose the introduction of, of superannuation, which, let's be fair, was a wage rise deferred. It was a wage rise deferred into superannuation. You oppose that. You oppose industry super funds all the way until they become a trillion dollar part of our economy, where they are instrumental in the GFC in, in bankrolling our banks, where there has been substantial change on the composition of boards. Unions did have the numbers in the old days. I was around in those days. There was five directors and four employers. It's been legislated to have an even number of employer representatives and union representatives with an independent chair. These things are working. But Senator Cormann wants to go further. He wants to further disenfranchise the voice of workers in their own uh, superannuation funds by adding another level of supervision, another level of cost, another level of cost. I mean, the guts of it is that all trustee directors act in the interests of members only. Adding another three independent directors at the sort of salaries that they command is got to be spread amongst the members of that super fund. There is no shortage of independent and professional advice in industry super funds. I have been a super or was a super fund trustee for 16 years. I chaired the investment committee. We were able to get we were able to get every bit of independent advice we needed. Order. No problem Order. whatsoever. Order. You, no, 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 no. That's not true, Senator Cormann. Order. If every boss was elected by his workers, then he would be allowed to sit on a super fund like we did. So there you go. Independent super funds, industry super funds, delivering year on, year out, very good returns. And here in this year, in this year, back to startlingly good returns. With proper governance, proper due diligence, proper access to independent advice, proper independent chairs, diligent employer representatives, diligent union representatives, no aspersions cast. No aspersions cast. There have been no failures. There have been no failures in industry super. It has been year on, year out, representing the trustees, the trustees representing the members and delivering for working people in Australia. And we want that to continue. And my super will be one of those things which will make that better and deliver better returns for working Australians. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Mason. Deputy President, when it comes to matters of, uh, of education, including higher education, I have often admired uh, the Prime Minister's uh, commitment, uh, her sincerity and her belief in the transformational aspects of education. I know, or I used to know, she welcomed serious policy debate in the area of education. She, like many of us uh, in Parliament, has benefited from a good education. I read her uh, National Press Club speech and it was excellent. She, I think, better than most people in this place, understands the role in it of education in changing our lives. It's important how we fund our schools, Deputy President. Very important how we fund our schools, both government and both non-government. All of us know in this place that standards are falling within our schools, both domestically and comparatively internationally. We spend a fortune in this country on education, 
and yet the sta our standards are actually falling. The United Nations says we are the, world, the best place in the world to live, according to the Human Development Index, and yet our education system is failing us. There's a real concern in the community about teacher quality, as you'd be aware, Deputy President. Teacher quality. Us and the, us and the government, there would not be much between us. A cigarette paper's difference between us about the importance of, of teacher quality, about the importance of uh, community engagement, about parental engagement. All those issues are absolutely key and are the key, in fact, to making Gonski work. You can throw buckets of money at education and it won't make a dime of difference, Deputy President. And that is why we need this debate in this country. As well as that, of course, plenty of schools say we're going to be worse off. They'll be worse off. Plenty in my home state of Queensland say that, in fact, under the Gonski reforms, they'd be worse off. So have we even have concerns about, pot, about where the money is going to go. And this feeds, of course, into higher education, and ultimately it feeds in not just the Prime Minister's right, stories about equity and opportunity, and they're important. It also ultimately feeds into productivity, a wealthier country, and our national interest. You cannot divorce education and educational outcomes from a more productive and indeed a better, more unified community. That is why this debate we have to have. And for some reason, Deputy President, the government doesn't seem to want to have it. Can you imagine a country that is vital for our, our nation's future, for our kids' future, spending what? Two and three quarter hours on it on Wednesday afternoon. As the Prime Minister herself said, it's the biggest change in school education in 40 years and there's less than three hours devoted to it. This is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. There are stacks of policy questions, and I've just touched on some that need to be teased out, but they won't be because there will not be the time. There hasn't been a debate either in the parliament or in the community about this issue. $16.2 billion of expenditure discussed in less than three hours, about $100 million every minute, and that is just not good enough. Let's turn in the debate, however, as my friend uh, Senator Abetz has pointed out, is now become standard practice. And this week is the highlight, it's the culmination, the standard practice of guillotining debate in this parliament by the Labor Party and the Greens. I remember Mr Oakeshott, Mr Oakeshott, remember him. The much vaunted new paradigm, the much vaunted new paradigm. You know, what have we got instead? We've got the application of the guillotine more times than in the French Revolution. This is the reign of terror. And now the Prime Minister is the new Madame Defarge with a nod and a wink at Senate despotism. The guillotine is being sharpened and it will be used ruthlessly throughout this week to stop debate. It is pathetic and the Labor Party is better than this. Much, much better than this. Jeez, well, I think in fact they are. But as you know, uh, Deputy President, I can resist anything except temptation, as you're aware. On the question of the coalition applying the guillotine, in, in, uh, in, in the 8th of December 2005, Senator Conroy said this, once again we are seeing the results of the government's complete arrogance and, more importantly, complete incompetence in managing the business of this chamber. You can forgive a desire to get your bills through by the end of a session. What you cannot forgive is this sheer arrogance and sheer incompetence. That is the effort task for a rotten government. Thank you, Senator Mason. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise uh, in today's Taking Note debate to refute some of those wild claims that have been made by those opposite uh, here today. And it's always a um, pleasure to follow Senator Mason, though he was somewhat quieter, obviously, uh, than normal. Um, but, and he talked about um, the need for um, education reform. And he's quite right. I know that those opposite do not support the Gonski reforms, but for those of us that have joined with parents and their children at many rallies, at meetings, at um, conferences, we know that this is a piece of legislation that is long, long overdue. Now, the simple fact, and I'll come back to that in a moment, Mr Deputy President, but the simple fact is um, the majority in this place today voted 
to vote on these bills by the end of the week. That's the simple fact. We have voted to vote on these, these important bills by the end of the week. And of course, more interjections, more complaints. But I've been here in opposition. I've seen how the previous uh, Howard government uh, ran the Senate. I'm, I've seen them filibuster debates out and not allowed proper scrutiny. That's what they've got form on this, and they've got a, a long record of abuse of the Senate in this, uh, when they were in government. But I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. What I want to talk about, um, and has been raised um, in the uh, debate today, is the legislation that we are talking about. Now, there are a number of pieces of legislation, but I did want to talk about, again about the Australian Education Bill and what that actually means and why it is so important to actually be debated and passed uh, this week before the parliament rises. Now, the National Plan uh, for Better Schools uh, will give every child the individual help they need to reach their potential. That it will lift teaching standards so the best and brightest are in charge of our schools and classrooms. It will provide more information about our schools to parents and the community about school funding and performance. It will tackle school bullying so every child can learn in a safe environment. The Gonski reforms um, that the legislation is in part based on is so vitally important uh, for our school children and indeed our future. So what I would, uh, would like to say to those opposite they, that they, would ne they need to go out to the community and say the reason why we couldn't do this today, when we already spent hours, hours this morning debating an, a time management motion. We had hours to do that. that. We also, we also, we also spent days days listening to Senator Birmingham, who um, is a very excellent um, member of parliament. But that we do we have to listen for days the same speech um, from Senator Birmingham on one piece of legislation. And that the reason why we that we had to do that, the reason why we had to do that, Mr Deputy President, was because the opposition wanted to come to this point. They wanted to say that um, the government was guillotining important pieces of legislation that they've been waiting, they've been waiting to debate. But that's not true. It's all construed oh, to come here to this point to make a, a position, a faux position out there, a faux argument about why they are concerned. Because they're not concerned. They oppose Gonski. I'm unsure of what their position is on the constitutional alteration of local government. Uh, referendum bill is. I'm happy for them to enlighten me, but I understand now that perhaps it will be a conscience vote on that issue. Some will support it and some won't. That is what the coalition has come to these days. They, can't, they, they, are, they are so keen to be such small targets they can't even have a proper debate in their caucus anymore and come out with a position. They just uh, allow, allow um, all sorts of things to be happening around, in, in, around the background. But there's many, many important pieces of legislation here that, that the community want us to progress, Gonski being one, the aged care bills being another, the charities bill being another. These are important pieces of legislation that need to be voted on by the end Thank of this you, week Senator for the future Brown. of Australia. Thank you, Senator Brown. Your time has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And I'm so glad to see the minister, um, whose answers we are taking note of today, come back into the chamber so I can remind him of his shameless hypocrisy in relation to the answers that he gave to the questions asked by Senators Cormann, myself and Mason. The minister, when answering the questions in relation to the guillotining of certain pieces of legislation, stated as follows. He said that we, as a coalition, were shameless to stand here and to ask the questions that we did. He then referred to the debate on work choices, stating that it had been gagged. But, Mr Deputy President, when you compare that work choices was given a full day's hearing, that is nothing compared to the motion 
that the Labor Party, along with their little alliance partners, the doormats, the Greens, voted to support in the Senate today. And in relation to the minister's hypocrisy, I too would like to read into the record some things that the minister said when he was in opposition and the former Howard government was in office. This is what this minister said in relation to the guillotine. It is the worst abuse of parliamentary process in my nine and a half years. What they are doing today has been a travesty of parliamentary democracy. What we are seeing now is an absolute farce, a guillotine. The ultimate expression of the Howard government's contempt for the Senate, however, can be seen in the government's willingness to debate to, to, to gag debate in the Senate. And Mr Deputy President, the list of quotes goes on and on and on. But nothing, nothing that the minister was commenting on when the former Howard government was in power compares to what this Senate voted on today. As of this evening, we are going to be ramming through this place 55 pieces of legislation and in relation to certain pieces of legislation that are of a highly contentious nature, the Senate is being given less than 15 minutes to debate those particular pieces of legislation. And can I tell you why? Can I tell you why, Mr Deputy President? In relation to the bills on Wednesday that we are going to be debating for less than 15 minutes, and in particular the Migration Amendment, Temporary Sponsored Visas Bill 2013, the bill which I asked questions about today in the Senate. This is the reason the government wants to ram it through the Senate, because this, of all the bills that have been guillotined, is a bill that has been solely designed by Minister O'Connor for his mates in the union. This is not good public policy. Their own Office of Best Practice Regulation stated in relation to the labour market testing aspects of this bill that the government it was beholden on them to conduct a regulatory impact statement. And do you know what the Prime Minister said to Minister O'Connor when he asked for an exemption? No worries, mate. Don't worry about it, because we made a promise to the CFMEU. We made a promise to the TWU. We made a promise to the AWU that we would ram this bill through the other place and then we would get it into the Senate and we would ram it through the Senate. And that is exactly, that is exactly what this motion does. It gives us all of 15 minutes to debate what probably is one of the most contentious pieces of legislation to come before this parliament in the, in the sitting period, and we get 15 minutes. But again, this is why. The Prime Minister herself, as we all know, despite the fact that she tells the people of Australia that the 457 system is being rorted, she herself employs her chief spin doctor, Mr McTurnan, lo and behold, on a 457 visa. The Prime Minister has been asked on several occasions under the Freedom of Information Act to produce the labour market testing in relation to Mr McTurnan. Her office on two occasions now have asked for extensions in excess of 40 days. She has now asked for a further extension, which has been de denied by the Information Commissioner. If the, if the Prime Minister was dinkum about the 457 visa system, she would automatically come to this parliament and she would produce the labour market testing in relation to Mr McTiernan, but she refuses to. She refuses to, and the only conclusion that can, can come from that is quite possibly there was no labour market testing and the Prime Minister herself is guilty of a rot in the 457 visa program. That's why this legislation has been Thank rammed you, through the parliament. Senator Cash, your time has expired on a separate matter. Senator Moon. I'll just put the question uh, moved by Senator Cormann. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise today to take note of an answer from Senator Conroy, representing the Minister for the Environment, uh, Minister Burke. And I stand today delighted that the World Heritage Committee meeting in Phnom Penh in Cambodia has today agreed to the extension of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area so that 170,000 hectares will be added to the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, Mr Deputy President. 
This is an exciting day, not only for Tasmania but for the world, because the world has recognised that these forests are of outstanding universal value to humankind. That is an extraordinary decision and something Tasmania can be really proud of. It further highlights that Tasmania, clean, green and clever, our brand for Tasmania is enhanced by recognising the value of these fantastic forests that we have. And Mr Deputy President, in standing here today celebrating this extension of our World Heritage Area, the protection uh, Mr. De Acting, I'm sorry, Mr Deputy President, the extension of the World Heritage Area means that these forests will be protected for all time. That is an amazing tribute to the people who have worked for that. And I go back to this campaign started in the early 1980s. No one will forget the Helsham Inquiry, Farmhouse Creek, and then in 1989 when we moved to put these forests into the World Heritage Area then, and it was resisted by the then Premier of Tasmania, Michael Field, and David Llewellyn, who uh, they fought against it. Uh, Graham Richardson was the Federal Minister for the Environment, would have included those areas had they been agreed to, but it was held out and against that by, as I said, Michael Field and David Llewellyn. Over the years, it was uh, Senator Bob Brown, it was Peg Putt, it was my colleagues in the Tasmanian parliament who fought for the protection of these areas, together with so many people in the community, the Wilderness Society, ACF, and names such as Alec Maher and Jeff uh, Law come to mind, not to mention people in the Huon Valley Environment Centre, Still Wild, Still Threatened, all the direct action groups, the wilderness photographers, the artists in Tasmania who worked so hard, and people like the late Helen G, whose book for the forests documents really well the campaign for the protection of forests. And I pay tribute to people like Helen and to people like Ben Morrow. Uh, ben, of course, who lost his battle with cancer, but uh, he was one of the people who worked hard. And now we're seeing the sticks the, the forests of the Styx, the World Valley, the Florentine, the Western Tiers, the glaciated landscapes of Mount Field, all going into uh, the extension to the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area. And of course, in looking at this, I look at also the people who resisted and opposed it for so long, and that included, uh, of course, uh, no one will forget the resource security legislation where the logging industry, supported by both the Liberal and Labor parties in Tasmania, worked to try to keep the forests out of protection. Uh, Ray Groom, when he was Premier, brought in the most draconian anti-forest protest laws, which, he, which uh, Paul Lennon was later forced to withdraw because they gave unfair competitive advantage to Tasmanian loggers over the mainland loggers, and of course the campaign that Jim Bacon and Paul Lennon, former premiers of Tasmania, ran to oppose forest protection. And in the end, it was a minority government in both Tasmania and federally who, working with the Greens, and I pay tribute to Nick McKim, my Tasmanian colleague, who worked at the Tasmanian level on the boundaries for this uh, Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Extension. My colleague, Senate, former Senator Bob Brown, who worked uh, and, and I worked with him last year to work with Minister Burke to get this nomination up and ready to be submitted by the 8th of February this year. And I am delighted that uh, Minister Burke got in that extension to the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area and that has been accepted and protected. I also welcome the fact that uh, the World Heritage Committee has called on the Tasmanian and Australian governments to assess the cultural heritage of the area, and I would include in that areas beyond the area that's currently been listed, but looking at that Tasmanian uh, Aboriginal heritage for the longer term, and I look forward to those assessments. I note that the coalition has opposed this extension to the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area and remains opposed, and it is now, it is now, um, it is now protected for all time. And I would urge the coalition to get behind this nomination and recognise what a fantastic thing it is for Tasmania and Australia to now be able to proudly say that those forests so long campaigned for are to be protected, will be protected, will be looked after for the future. And I congratulate everyone concerned. There will be, there'll be a great celebration Thank you, Senator in Tasmania. Milne. The time has expired. I put the motion moved by Senator Milne. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator